Vowel Rhythms is brought to you by the New Journal and Guide and executive publisher Brenda H. Andrews. Today we're in the studios of Dream City University. We have a very special show for you today and a very, very special guest. His name, Mr. Monty Ross. All right. Good to be Thank here. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, not a problem. Not I am problem. so glad to have you on the show, Monty. I mean, I've, since I first met you, I said, this is a good, decent, intelligent brother. Uh, with a good heart and, and, and especially gifted. Yeah. So um, we want to talk about your career in a second. If, if folks are going to know more about oh, you yeah, in just yeah, a few, but yeah. let, where, did, where did you begin? Where did it all start? Where were you born, Monty? <laughs> I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, in Omaha? Yeah, okay. Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. Uh, and yes, there are black people in Omaha, <laughs> okay, Nebraska. Okay, all right. I always have to throw that in because people always say, Omaha, Nebraska. You and know? a big insurance company. And a big insurance <laughs> right, company. Right. Warren Buffett is from Omaha, Nebraska. I didn't know One that. One of the richest men in the world. Uh, Johnny Carson was from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Bob Gibson, uh, world famous World Series pitcher with the pitcher, St. Louis right. Cardinals. Uh, Johnny Rogers uh, is from there. Uh, UNO is big, big football, big football town. Yeah. And, and there, there's Monty Ross, and you've yeah. done some pretty incredible things. Uh, you were born in, uh, in Omaha. Mm -hmm. How long did you live there? You, you were educated in the school system there? Yeah, I uh, went to Long Elementary School, Conestoga Elementary School, okay. after that Tech High, uh, and then I went to North High School and graduated uh, a long, 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 long time ago. Okay. And uh, after that I went to uh, Morehouse College my first year, uh, scholarship ran out. I went to Bishop College after that, and uh, then I came back and attended uh, Clark College, and later, Clark is now uh, Clark Atlanta University, but mm -hmm. back then it was just uh, Clark College, and I ended up graduating from Clark College. Okay, we're going to talk about an acquaintance that you uh, mm -hmm. uh, found in, in the university in the college setting, um, but before we do that, what was your major in school? Um, a major in, in college is actually social work. So I have a, I have a degree in, in social science and a minor in, in mass communications. Okay, now you are a filmmaker, a director, an instructor, um, and you met someone in a college setting that uh, played a big part of your life for some 17 yeah. years. Uh, who was that? Well, that was, that was Spike Lee. Spike Lee. That was Spike Lee. We both uh, attended uh, Morehouse that same year, class of uh, 1979, but uh, he ended up graduating with the class of 1979, and I ended up over at uh, Clark, as I said previously. But um, in theater, that's where I really, uh, really, really got a real hold on what I wanted to do in school. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, you had to think 1975, so you're thinking about, you know, all of the social things that are going on. It's the end of the Civil Rights Movement. Right. Uh, but we were still babies growing up in the Civil Rights Movement, so we really had that as a part of, you know, our mission and who we were and giving back to the community was a uh, priority. But in theater, that's when I could really be myself. And I didn't know that until... That first semester of school, I was really bored. I finished my homework and did all those things, and I went across the street from uh, Morehouse over to Clark, and I wandered into the drama department, and I fell in love with it. You know, it was it was just it just it, it felt right. And the first <laughs> play was The Bad Seed. I auditioned for it. I got in the cast and had a wonderful time. And I started meeting actors. And some of the actors who had been there previously, one was uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Ah, okay. So I met Sam when, way, back, way back then. I met his, his wife was, uh, at the time he wasn't married, but uh, his wife was uh, Latonya Richardson. I they see. were dating yeah, back okay. then. Uh, Kenny Leon, who just won a, uh, a Tony for uh, the, uh, Raising in the Sun, uh -huh. uh, he was a classmate of mine. And that was we a were, good place to be. <laughs> so we, were, we all, uh, quote unquote, were theater rats. You know, we hung out in the theater. That's what we love to do. And Kenny, well, he may get on me uh, for saying this, but, <laughs> and he may not. But he is, his girlfriend used to come up and visit and she would come over to the theater, and that was Angela Bassett. 
Okay. So I met a young Angela Bassett, right, you know, right. before all the fame. So there's a, all of these folks, uh, Bill Nunn, Bill Nunn, yes. um, who played Radio Rahim and Do the Right Thing, uh -huh. was in the school days. He was also, you know, one of our theater buddies. And it's just tons of other folks um, who were there at the time. So I was very fortunate to meet them. And I think when I look back on it, the, the best thing about that experience was for some strange reason, we all looked at each other and became friends. I mean, friends in the truest sense of the word. Meaning, what, we what do you think caused that? Do you think it was just because you had a, a kindred spirit or a kindred interest, or what, what was that? I think it was a, a, a kindred spirit. You okay. know, because you had to really stand on that stage and deliver. You couldn't be, you know, standing on that stage with, with the likes of the Samuel Jackson, right, right. The, you know, likes of Latanya. With the, I mean, you had to, bring you had it. to really bring yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> so, bring it. Right. So as a as a freshman, man, my eyes are wide open, <laughs> and I said, if I want to hang out with these folks, they're really taking this stuff serious. You know, they they really are, are passionate about their careers, but they're also are furthering their education. So for me, you know, white eyed guy from Omaha, I'm like, yes, yeah, this is, really. this, these folks are really cool. Right. And, uh, and that was, in, in general though, that was the uh, Atlanta University Center. And as most people who have gone to HBCUs can, can attest to, it's the spirit. It's, 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 the, it's the camaraderie. You are gonna meet someone who may have a very, uh, 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 you know, they may, their parents may be just rich. Let's just call it what it is. Uh, and they may come and say, okay, you know, but you have kids from poor working backgrounds, blue collar backgrounds, and you get all of us together and the next thing you know, you have everybody trying to feed off of each other. We're all the motivating each other. We're all helping each other out. At least that's the HBC that I grew up. That was the Understood. environment that I grew up. I don't know if it's still like that. It probably is on, on some level. Let me ask you a question. You say that uh, when you found theater, you kind of like found something that felt very natural and comfortable. Mm -hmm. Had you had any interest or done any theater at all uh, in, in, in the school system back yeah. in Omaha? Yeah, you had I done did. some other things, okay. Yeah, and uh, in Omaha, well, for me it, it was weird because I was a shy kid. And, you know, well, a lot the, of us are <laughs> in the theater. <laughs> and I had the thick glasses. And I was dark skinned, mm -hmm. and believe you me, you know, you you you, you get introverted really quick, sure, you know. Sure. But I had this other side of me that always came out in church. Church felt like, you know, I could I could really be myself. And um, so the story goes: one day the choir director, we were acting up. I think we were like seventh, eighth grade. We were acting up in choir rehearsal. She said, "I've had enough. I've had enough." You know, I'm telling your parents, and we're like, "Okay, okay." And she said, well, I want somebody to, to speak. Oh, you guys are always talking. I want somebody to speak on, uh, for youth that. And that the room got, <laughs> you hear a pen drop, right? <laughs> so my friend looks at me, man, you always saying you're going to say something, say something. So I said, okay. So my hand shot up. She said, okay, Monty's going to, Monty's volunteered to uh, deliver a speech. Everybody turned around and said, Monty, are you going to deliver the speech? Oh, all right. And uh, I got home, man. I was shaking. <laughs> <laughs> and for two weeks, you know, I was trying to prepare, trying to prepare, right, trying to prepare. Right. And I just didn't really know how to prepare for it. And then I just said, you know what? I'm just going to be myself. Right. So the day comes. I get up there, you know, and they introduce me. And I go up there. You know, I don't know what I said to this day. <laughs> I don't know what I said. Whatever I but said, it worked. Though, yeah. the, the place erupted. Fantastic. And the organist, you know, she would, as soon as, you know, the spirit would catch on, you know, she would, <laughs> you know. So I heard that organ, I was like, whoa, what's going on, right? And, uh, and after that, uh, she picked me to be in any play, you know, I said, okay, man, I want you to but, learn but these wasn't lines. That, didn't that tell you something that you had, you had, uh, you had it? I, I guess. <laughs> But see, that was that was in the church, and right, so right. they're always in, in, encouraging you, you know. To and if you have, if you show any promise, you know, they're right. gonna push you right out there. Now, what happened in high school, junior, junior? So this is around ju my junior year that all of this uh, starts to take place. Uh -huh. But anyway, um, I go audition for a play. I don't even remember the play. 
I was shaking. But this was out in the community. This was not at the church. No, no this wasn't at the church. This was okay. at school, right? Okay. So at school, it was very formal. You uh, know? Okay. Uh, this is when I hear the term audition. I didn't know anything about <laughs> audition, right? And I'm sitting in the class, you know, and all the other thespians come in. You know, you could all tell they were the high school thespians. Right, you know? right. And they're looking at me like, well, who's, this, who's this guy? Who's this guy, right? So they pass out the book, you know, the, the play. Script, right? The script. So they pass it out, man. Right. And it was one of these uh, little books like this. So the letter's about this thing, <laughs> little, little, right, right. right? I hadn't read a script. <laughs> right, so they had to really point to when I was supposed to, you know, my part came up. They were like, they looked at me like, oh my God, who is this yeah, guy, right, right? Right, right? And man, I stumbled through that and I didn't care, you know, I didn't care. And uh, I even had the nerve to go back. Uh, for callbacks to look, look and see if I made it for callbacks, right? And I hadn't made it, right? And uh, they all the all the all the that's been you know cast were just walking past me and like looking like, dude, like why don't you just give it up? Why don't you go to the Black Studies Department? Right, why don't you go right. hang out over there? Yeah. So I told my um, counselor, I said, listen, man, put me in all of all of, all my electives. I want to do theater classes. Yeah. Yeah. The the groundwork had been laid for you to succeed and excel in the college theater environment. It, so, somewhat, but yeah. I was discovering all this. I was a late bloomer. I was discovering all of this. And like I said, the fact that I went to audition first for right. this play and I was, I did so horrible, I just, man, I needed another chance, you know. And that came out of me as far as uh, understanding who I was, that I was the type of person, you know, if you tell me no, I'm going to find a way to get in. And those classes were a way for me to open up and really understand what was going on and, 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 and learn about how plays are structured, right, the writing, right. and then when you start reading about the, the bios of the writers, then you begin to see like what they went through. I could identify with that. Understood. Now, let's, let's fast forward a bit, because I, I, I could talk to you all day, and we need to go out yeah. and throw a couple down and, and chat. Yeah. But let's fast forward to, uh, you know, you, you met Spike in college, mm -hmm. um, and you, you, get, you guys began a collaboration that endured for some 17 years. Right. What kind of projects did you work on with Spike? Uh, we worked on, you know, we worked on a lot of different projects. Spike majored, uh, by the time he was a junior, he had to declare a major, so he uh, chose film. So he had to do small film projects and, and things like that. So Spike would always uh, come to me, hey man, I need you to do a voiceover. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, boom, I, I do the voiceover. He said, man, I'm doing a photography shoot. I need you to, you know, can you, can you I need to use your hands to, to model. Right. I said, okay, cool, we, whatever. And so whenever he had these little small projects, he would come get me to do voiceovers and things like that. So, you know, he would put his stuff up in class and all of a sudden, you know, he, would get, he was getting A's, you know. Right. So then, um, Dr. Herbert Eichelberger, who was in charge of the film department, came to me and, and he said, man, you know, you and Spike, you know, you guys are a really good team, you work together, and it seems like, you know, he pulls you in and he gets an A, a in class, you know. And I'm like, cool. So that began our, our working relationship, and we shot an eight millimeter, eight millimeter movie uh -huh. uh, called Black College, The Talented Tenth, and that was by a mutual friend named George Folks. And George wanted to go to film school, and we just so happened to get a grant. Um, it was like a thousand dollar grant, and I have to, to this day to think, uh, he's not a councilman, uh, it was, it was uh, Michael Lomax, and Michael Lomax now, I think he still works with, um, I think he's president of one of the colleges, I can't think of now, but it was him who was very influential in getting a grant for the AU Center for, and, and, and getting that grant, that really jump-started us. Uh, Rolanda Watts, who ended up, you know, having a career in television before Oprah Winfrey. She was in, she was involved. She was the, the co-star. I was the star. And we shot a little eight millimeter movie, about 15 minutes. We took it to all the campuses and uh, screened the movie and, and got feedback. And little did we know that was the, the germ. That was the thing that got us really involved in, uh, in the whole process from the idea, conceiving, the scripting, to, to filming, and then you know, marketing and, and promoting and, and then distribution. Before we talk about some of the, the projects that, uh, that you guys worked on together that, you know, that went uh, so, did so well, mm -hmm. um, you did something yourself. You were telling me the other day about a, a piece that I can't remember. It was about a barbershop. What was that? Oh, that was Joe's Bed-Stuy Barbershop. Yeah. We cut heads. Um, that was Spike's thesis film. And, okay. Uh, 
He he wrote the script. Okay. And he said, hey man, I've written this script. And, and I have all of these letters that Spike used to write. I mean, before the internet and before texting. You still have those letters? I still have the letters. I, I mean, it's like a, a huge, voluminous amount of letters. And Spike is, is, is the letter writer. He loves to write letters. Uh -huh. And so he, he would write a letter, hey man, you know, every step along the way, I'm finishing up uh, uh, grad school. I, I have this, uh, I have a, a script that I've written, Joe's Best Star Barbershop. We cut heads. He told me to. You know the whole synopsis for the the, the uh, script. And you were and featured. You played the lead. Yeah, and I and I auditioned for the lead, and I got it. Okay. Yeah, and I went up to New York. So you had to audition for him. Oh, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And All it was right. good when I wanted to audition too. Right. You know, because I wanted him. I didn't just because we were friends. I didn't want him to feel like. I understand. You know, he had to uh, quote unquote hook me up. Right. I wanted to actually, you know, go through the whole process of auditioning. Get to New York though, and he said, "Hey, man." Your license is good. Yeah, yeah, my license is good. So I ended up <laughs> driving the production <laughs> van, helping out with wardrobe, right. helping out with props, yeah. you know. And that's when I learned about those twenty camera cases yeah, and grip yeah, equipment yeah, and yeah. <laughs> dolly equipment. And uh, you know, we loaded all of the uh, equipment in his uncle's uh, basement, and that's where we worked from in, in Brooklyn. And the story is, uh, I've been knowing Malcolm Lee uh, since he was eating milk and cookies. And Malcolm used to come downstairs to the basement and say, what are you guys doing? We said, we're making films. And he got really wide-eyed and, and said, hey, man, wow, that's pretty cool. For those that don't know, Malcolm, Malcolm Lee. Lee. Malcolm Lee is a uh, director now of uh, one of the big hit movies, uh, Best Man Holiday, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that whole series. But uh, I'm really proud of him. And, and like I said, to watch him go from a small child to what he's doing now, I'm just, I'm just really happy. Okay, yeah, before we went out of time, I, I want to get uh, some more information, so share some more information about yeah. you. Uh, but before we do that, just if you could just run off some of the films that you and Spike did that our, our viewers would know. Oh, uh, they probably know uh, She's Gotta Have It, right. uh, Do the Right Thing, Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, uh, Crooklyn. And you worked Hoppers, on Malcolm X too, didn't you? Uh, Malcolm X, right. yeah, and also did a film for uh, Showtime Paramount on uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, Spike. Spike. And then I went back and hung out with Spike on um, on Inside Man. Yeah. Okay. And I went uh. back and just coordinated, you know, his uh, his intern uh, program. I see. Have, but, I yeah. see. So all in all, I would say that as a uh, learning to be. I was about to ask you, what did you learn from that? Learning experience? to be a. a, a a co-producer, learned to be a vice president of, of production. We really learned by, by doing. And the reaction that we got on Spike's work was, was really amazing. Because, you know, you, you got a 350 square foot loft. You got, you know, a broke down bed and Spike's bed <laughs> kind of right. leaning to the side. You got right. a big old round, you know, kitchen table, this big old phone. And we're sitting here talking about, man, you know, when this film comes out, yada, 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 yada. And, and, and Spike is saying, man, I got to get this shot in, in, in three weeks. I said, man, I can get your film made for you in two weeks. And we figured out, you know, well, we're going to be creative here. We're going to be creative there. We're going to do it this way, do it this way. And we ended up uh, shooting it in 12 days. And um, it, it felt good. It really felt like this is something that... Um, if you, it, it was one no, of those this things. Was, this was she's, was she's got to have, have it. it. And this right. was like the summer of 85. And I always tell people, people always ask me, you know, like, you know, what's one of my favorite films? And of course, it's Malcolm X. Of course, there's, you know, the big films. But it was that film, She's Got to Have It, because that was every single ounce of energy that we were giving to our careers and giving to ourselves and really believing and having faith in each other. And uh, knowing that, you know, whatever happens, whatever happens, good or bad, you know, we were going forward, right. and, you know, and not backwards. And one of the things that Spike doesn't do now that he used to do back then, especially if you look at uh, school days, you know, he comes running down the hall and he fist pumps. Right, right, right. And there were so many fist pump days uh, when we were doing She's Gotta Have It. You know, for every little obstacle that we got into. Right. Every time we got a, a solution to it, you know, it seemed to work. And it seemed like to be more magic. It was more magic helping us move forward, move forward. So there's a lot of, yeah, yeah. 
you know, that kind of thing. So now you you work uh, with a uh, an acquaintance of mine uh, with Spike, and that's Ruth Carter, uh, costume yeah. designer, who's doing a whole lot now. Yeah, Ruth yeah. Carter. Uh, Ruth Carter uh, joined us on um, school days, okay. and she actually uh, took over my apartment because she was there in New York working with Spike. So my apartment was just maybe like like seven seven blocks, seven New York City blocks from the office, and so she came and she. Took over my office. Uh, took over my apartment, you right. know. And so, uh, I had to run back. She's gonna be like, "Mommy, don't tell this story." So I had to run back, right, <laughs> to the apartment. Said, I'm gonna make sure she sees this. <laughs> so I said, "I said, I said, you know, I, I said, Ruth, I gotta come to the apartment. I gotta pick up something. And I gotta go back to Atlanta." Yeah. She said, "Okay, okay." So I come running back, and she's all dressed up, you know. I mean, she was looking very professional. First day, you know, that she's gonna uh. be with Spike. And I looked, and she had these heels on. They were like really tall heels. I mean, she looked great. Believe me. Oh, she's a beautiful woman. Very. And yeah. I said, I said, mm, I think you should wear sneakers. And she said, What? <laughs> Look what I got on, Monty. You know, I got to, you know, I got to set the tone. I'm a stylist. And I said, Listen, 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 listen. First of all, you got to walk down the hill. All right. I said, then you got to be with Spike all day. And Spike is known to walk. Spike is known to be over here. Spike right. is known to be over there. And if you got on those tall shoes, he's gonna look at you like, Oh man, maybe I made a mistake. So she had some, got some sneakers, changed her whole gear up, and, and went to work. And she's been working in the industry and ended up Doing, working with Spike yeah, you know, yeah. for, for a long time on all of the films, et cetera. What, do we, what can we look for uh, in the next few years for Monty Ross? Uh, I have films to finish. You know, there's one finish on, on Dr. Roland Wiggins. It's a documentary. I have to finish uh, that film because Dr. Wiggins was very... Put it like this, he was into uh, the computerization of music back in the 50s, and he was working with the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia on a project, and um, very much if you think about Garage Band or you think about the way music is played now through the computers, he was working on this back in the 50s, and mm -hmm. tons of other, he has tons of other influences uh, in the world of education, so I wanted to, to do a documentary on him. I have another two or three documentaries that we're wor I'm working on. I have a feature film that I have to finish. Uh, and also Mr. Clyde Santana, who I met here, who was a prolific writer. Good had, brother. Good brother, yes. good brother. And we have uh, his project, Loco, that we're working on, in addition to all of his other projects that right. we're working on. Right. So, and the goal is to get, get Clyde's work out there. And, uh, and I just want to say, man, we're really happy, and, and we appreciate you taking the time to do this, man. So. Well, I'm delighted to be working with you guys because, uh, you know, you're, you're all a part of the production team for the show, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it makes it even sweeter to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to interview you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, I want to thank you for, uh, for uh, doing what you do at The Addicts as well as uh, with Biorhythms. Mm -hmm. um, if there could be one thing that you would say to an aspiring filmmaker, what would that be? I would say you got to make films. I would say that to that, that particular person. You know, tall, short, skinny, you know, uh, whatever your disability is, uh, whatever yeah. it is that you are going through as a person, you know, you have to really make films. And today, everything is very affordable. If you don't have a camera, you have at least five people who have cameras. Right. You know, some people have uh, four cameras, three cameras. There's lighting that's available. Uh, what is really missing is people really understanding how to craft a great story. And the more to you tell know how to craft a great story, and then learn the skill of how to show, not tell, the a story. great story. Right. Well, I want to thank you so very much, Monty, for joining us today. Oh, uh, this man, has been an incredible me. time. Yeah, yeah. And we want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Bowel Rhythms. Be sure to take a look at our website at terrorvisionent.com. That's terrorvisionentertainment.com. Producers of Biorhythm, we want to thank everybody on the production team, and especially thank you for joining us on Biorhythm.